Glad you're here. Can you believe this rain? And we have more coming. Let me get this off of me here. More coming this week. And so uh, we might as well build an ark, it looks like. So uh, happy Valentine's Day, and we're glad that you're here. Let me give you a couple updates before we jump into the announcements. Uh, um, as you notice, LaVon is not here this morning. She got her double, her second shot for the COVID vaccine. And for many people, it knocks them out for several days. And so it is, she is experiencing some of the side effects of that second shot. So that's why she's not here. Uh, also, many of you know that Debbie Wood is in the hospital. Uh, she went in last Tuesday night um, from effects from the COVID virus that she got. And uh, she was in ICU from Tuesday night through Friday morning. Um, she is now in a room. Uh, she is making slow progress. She has a blood clot in each lung. Um, they are dissolving those clots. Uh, they're not wanting her to go home until she can maintain an oxygen level of 94%. She was able yesterday to walk from, her room's at the very end of the hallway, walk all the way up and back without her oxygen. And uh, it was laboring for her, but it, her oxygen level dropped from 96 to 89% which is better. It had been dropping down in the low 80s, so the clots are slowly dissolving, but they don't want her leaving and going home so she can maintain a 94% at least. So she's in there through probably Tuesday. So just letting you know that, but she's making progress. And they've asked that we not text or call her because it's laboring for her to do that. And one thing, she can't even talk. Uh, it, I don't know if you know this, if you have a blood clot in your lung, one of the things it does, it prohibits you from talking. But she is... Uh, now to a whisper, which is good as these clots slowly, slowly dissolve. So keep those folks in your prayers this week. I know there's others. Uh, one, uh, one of our home, Rick over here. Raise your hand, Rick. He had uh, knee replacement surgery on Monday, and he walked in here today. Glad you're back, Rick. So uh, there is a lot of good news going on, and we're always e elated for all of you. Some of you here have gone through COVID, and we're glad that you're back with us. And uh, Pray that you will stay healthy from it, all right? And this is why I ask that you wear your mask, keep them on, so that uh, you are safe and others are safe as well, all right? So let's look at some of these announcements that we got coming up. As we tell you every week, our nursery and children's church area are totally COVID safe for your kids. We sanitize, we do everything the CDC tells us to do so that you feel comfortable and your children are safe. Uh, also, don't forget our crew ministry. This is what we do for local missions here. Crew stands for, as you see there, <coughs> Christians, ready, equipped, and willing. Keith Sargent, back there, Keith, raise your hand. He's in charge of that. And uh, if you would like to help with some local mission projects, like we go out and build ramps for people who need handicap accessibility, uh, we'd love to have you help us with that, all right? Our Revelation study is still ongoing on Wednesday nights, and we'd love to have you for that. It meets at 6.30 over there in our fellowship hall. Next Sunday, we begin a new sermon series called Spiritual Boot Camp. And next Sunday's sermon looks at what do you want to do when you're just you're ready to throw in the towel. Life's come at you, and, you're, and it's been coming at you, and you're just tired of it, and you just want to quit. So we're going to look at our military is the best in the world, and they train our soldiers to to face every kind of situation. And because of that training, because of their ability to do that, our military is the best. So we're gonna, I'm going to draw some principles from our own military through eight sermon series on helping you be spiritually ready for the battles that you face. Because the Bible tells us our battles are not against flesh and blood. It's really against a, it's a spiritual battle. All right, this coming Saturday we have a leadership meeting. All right. And so be here at 9 o'clock, all leaders, uh, beginning next Sunday at 9 a.m. And the following Sunday, we have class 201, which helps you learn how to grow spiritually in Christ. If you don't know how to do that over two Sundays at 9 o'clock in the morning, I'll teach you how to do that, how you grow in your relationship to Christ. Also, there is a webinar coming on that you can sign up for. I don't know if you realize this. There are more Christians being killed today around the world than any other time in history. All three of these men have faced imprisonment for their faith. Uh, in countries, in just this past week, a pastor in Malaysia uh, was um, kidnapped, and no one has seen him or heard of him. So realize the gospel is offensive to people, but we're called to share it. Also, there are three ways to give, in person and by mail and online. 
And so I thought since today is Valentine's Day, I have this little video for you. Watch this. Happy Valentine's, everybody. Glad you're here today, all right? So let's pray. Father God, we give you thanks and praise. As we go to the truth of your word, we want it to be a lamp unto our feet and a light in our path that we can hide your word in our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, today we're wrapping up the final sermon in this series in faith, finances, and a fresh start. And I hope it's been very helpful to you. And as I said, my big concern today is I want you working not to make money, but I want your money working for you rather than you working for your money. Today, a lot of people live from paycheck to paycheck, and God doesn't want you doing that. He doesn't want you sitting there wondering uh, at the end of the month, where did it all go? He doesn't want you trying to rob from Peter to pay Paul. He wants your money working for you. And so over these five sermons I've given to you about money, if you will take all of these biblical principles and apply them to your life, as you saw last week in the eight principles I give you, you can get yourself out of debt and live a debt-free life and learn how to pay cash for everything so that your money's working for you rather than you working for your money. You can learn this concept of contentment that God calls us to have. You can learn how to make, your, make sure your yearnings don't exceed your earnings. Okay, So over these four or five sermons we've had, I've been trying to give you a biblical basis because... The number one reason couples say they divorce today is not due to incompatibility, but money. Money is killing marriages today. Because one in couples are spending more money than they make, or someone in the marriage is spending more money than they make, and so it creates all kinds of problems. All right? And I've given you all kinds of ways to get out of this so that it works for you rather than you working for it. So today we wrap up. And today we're going to look at how do we make our money last past ourselves? How can we invest our money in something that's bigger than us, beyond us, so that it goes on past us after we're dead and gone? Jesus said this in Matthew 6. He said this, don't store up treasures here on earth where moth eats them and rust destroys them and thieves break in and steal i got a few names here I want you to see. Do these names ring a bell with you? Alima State Bank, they have holdings of $18.3 million. First City Bank, uh, Fort Walton Beach, they have uh, holdings of $10 million. First State Bank in Barbersville, West Virginia, they have uh, assets of $46.8 million. That should say First National Bank of New Orleans, Louisiana. They have uh, assets of almost $1 billion dollars. Guarantee Bank of Milwaukee, they have $146.4 million in assets. First National Bank of Edinburgh, Texas, $637.5 million assets. National Republic Bank of Chicago, $11.6 million. Capital City Bank of Atlanta, $88.9 million. They have a combined assets of over $2 billion. Do you know what all of these banks have in common? Bring it up. They all failed in the last two years. Remember what I said? I've said this in every sermon. Do not put your money in something that's been taken away from you. If you put your security in anything that's been taken away from you, that is wrong. All this, think about $2 billion of assets gone in two years. And they are predicting more banks to fail over the next five years, more than ever in the history of America. 
So you need your money working for you rather than you working for your money. Never let your security come from anything that can be taken away from you because you, it can happen. It can happen immediately. Jesus says this, store up your treasures, store for yourselves treasures in heaven where moss and rust cannot destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Jesus said to store up our treasures in heaven. So to me, the big question is this, how do you invest treasures in heaven? How do you invest it in eternity? Okay. I went through the Bible over 21 different times. There are 21 different scripture references where the Bible emphasizes storing up your treasure in heaven. Now, I'm, I've got a slide of them. I'm not going to read all of these to them. You can read them. Bring up the next slide. You, they can, you can read this for yourself, all right? There are 21 different verses in scripture where the Bible emphasizes, and it uses the word store up your treasures in heaven. Now, to me, if God emphasizes something 21 times, that's something we should know, we should remember, we should put to practice, we should take to heart, okay? So I don't want you to miss this. God wants you storing up your treasures in heaven. So let's go back and look at the verse again. Jesus said, don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth, okay? Store them up in heaven where moss and rust cannot destroy them. Thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. So I want you to circle that phrase. For yourselves. Notice you're storing up treasures not for God, not for anybody else. You're storing up treasures for yourselves in heaven. He's not, storing, he's not saying store up treasures for angels, but for yourselves. So the question is, how do I store up treasures in heaven? That's what Jesus commands us to do. Now, you've heard me say all the time, <laughs> you can't take it with you. You can't take it with you. You'll never see a U-Haul in a funeral procession, but you can send it ahead. So how do you do that? How do you send this ahead? Well, I'm going to show you a couple of introductory verses here. Paul says this in 1 Timothy. He starts out with this. He says this, tell those who are rich. Let me just stop right there. You remember in the first sermon in this series, I told you every one of you are rich. You're wealthy. Now, you see, you go, no, I'm not, because you want to compare yourself to Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg or Jeff Bezos, these billionaires. But you are, compared to the rest of the world, you are wealthy. You are rich. Do you know that 3 billion people in the world live on less than $2.50 a day? Did you know that 1.3 billion people live on a dollar and a quarter a day? That's it. If you have any change in your pocket, if you have a little dish you put loose change in at home, or you have a little change sitting in your car, you are in the top 5% of the world's population. So compared to the rest of the world, you and we all are filthy rich. So let's go back to the verse. He says, tell those who are rich, which are you and I, not to be proud and not to trust in their money, which soon will be gone. But their pride and trust should be in the living God who richly gives us all we need for our enjoyment. God gives you these things for your enjoyment. Now notice what he says here. Tell them to use their money to do good. So I want you to circle that phrase. Use to do good. Use your money to do good. Now we've talked about this in this series over and over, that, that money is a tool. It's neither good nor bad. It's neutral. You can use it for good things, and you can use it for evil things. He says, tell them to use their money to do good. So let's go to the rest of this, beginning in 1 Timothy 6, 18b and verse 19. Look what he says. They should be rich in good works, meaning use your money to do good works. And should give happily to those in need. Always ready to share with others whatever God has given them. By doing this, by meaning using your money to do good deeds, they will be storing up real treasures for themselves in heaven. There's that phrase again. It is only safe environment, the only safe investment that is worth eternity. Okay, so how do I store up treasure in heaven? I use my money to do godly and good deeds. That's how you store up treasure. 
You use your money, you use some of your money to do godly and good deeds. As I said, money is neither good or bad, it's neutral. So you use your money to do good deeds. So let's look at the verse. He says this, those who are rich in good works and should give happily to those in need, always ready to share with others whatever God has given them. By doing this, they will be storing up real treasure for themselves in heaven. They will be storing up real treasure for themselves in heaven. It is the only safe investment for eternity, and they will be living a fulfilled, I mean, a fruitful Christian life down here as well. So if I store up my treasures in heaven by doing good deeds here, God says I will have not only an investment in eternity, but I have blessings here on this earth. So how do I do that? Well, I gave you a verse a couple of weeks ago found in Ecclesiastes 11. Verse 2 says, invest what you have in several different places because you don't know what disasters might happen. And if you take your money and you go to any financial advisor, he will tell you, don't put all your eggs in one basket. Don't put all your retirement money in one fund. You could lose it overnight. So you put it in different funds because there are risks involved. Now, what I'm about to share with you, there are five spiritual funds you can put your money in for eternity. Now, I got this idea from a guy online. He's a Christian financial guru. His name is Michael Cardrett. He came up with these five spiritual funds, and I took what he did, and I footnoted it there on your outline for you, gave you the website where you can go look at this yourself. And I've taken what he said, and I've kind of rechanged it a little bit for us today to fit within what I wanted to talk about. Okay? So let's look at these five different funds. How can you store up treasure in heaven? Here's the first way. Store up your treasure in what's called God's growth fund. This fund is about growing my character through discipleship. So when I take my money and I want to invest in eternity, I'm growing my character. So one of the first things you want to do is grow your character. You hear me say this all the time. Okay? The only thing you're taking with you to heaven is your character. You're not taking any of your comforts. See, we love comforts, but God is more interested in building your character than he is in making you comfortable. So you invest your money in things that grow your character. Look at Proverbs 10, 16. The earnings of the godly, notice this, enhance their lives. But evil people squander their money on sin. I want you to circle the phrase, enhance their lives. God wants you to take some of your money to enhance your life. So how do I enhance my life with my money? Well, on your notes, I've given you four ways you can do that. I can use my money to grow how? I use it to grow spiritually, intellectually, relationally, emotionally, and then physically. Those are the four ways you use your money, invest in this growth fund that grows your character through discipleship. You want to invest in money, invest your money in these things that grow you spiritually. When you take your money to improve your skills, your talents, your abilities, you are enhancing your life. You're growing your character. You're not going to take your car to heaven. You're not going to take your china to heaven. You're not going to take your condo to heaven. All you're taking to heaven is your character. So God wants you to take some of your money, invest it in what grows that character. As I said, we love to sit on comfortable couches and sleep in comfortable beds. Okay? I don't know if you, I don't know for some of you, I've noticed the older I get, I don't sleep as well. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I just sleep like a rock. Now, Audrey will tell you, this frustrates her, okay? Uh, she's sitting right here. You can ask her at the end of the service. We go to bed, and within three seconds, I'm out. I'm gone. I'm, I'm already snoring. And she goes, how does someone go to sleep that fast? I do. I mean, I'm gone. But then I'll toss and turn during the night. I'll turn and go, oh, my back aches, this aches, or whatever, you know. All right. Now, there's nothing wrong having a comfortable couch or a comfortable bed to sit on, but you're not taking that with you to heaven. God wants you to invest in your character for him. Jesus did. Look at this in Luke chapter 2, verse 52. It says this, Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all the people. Now, what is that verse telling us there? It's telling us what I just shared with you. 
Luke 2.52 says Jesus grew four ways. He grew in wisdom, that's intellectual growth. He grew in stature, that's physical growth. He grew in favor with God, that's spiritual growth. And he grew in favor with man, that's relational, emotional growth. And anytime you take your money and you use it, you invest in growing your character, you are investing in eternity. You're storing up your treasure in heaven. So anytime you take your money to buy a Christian book to read, uh, download a podcast to listen to, a Christian podcast, or listen to Christian music, anytime you pay to go to a Christian retreat or a Christian seminar or, or anything like that, you are investing your treasure in heaven. You're growing your character to be more like Christ. You're investing God's growth fund. I found this interesting. A guy named Charles Simpson, uh, he's a pastor, and he said he was on vacation one time, and he came across this guy whose job is to go out and get fish for big aquariums around the world. That's this guy's job. And so he asked him, he says, what's the favorite fish that people or sea life that people want? He says, sharks. That's the number one thing they want me to go after. He said, so what I do is I get the baby sharks, the little tiny baby sharks. He said, now this is what you need to know. The way God designed sharks is they will only grow in proportion to the size of the aquarium they are in. He says, I can show you these little home aquariums. They're like this, like this. you got a full-grown tiger shark in it, but he's just six inches long. Full adult. Because they grow in proportion to the size of their environment. He says, now if I go in and I safely transport that baby tiger shark to the ocean, he'll grow to eight feet or nine feet. They grow in proportion to the size of their environment. And then he went on to say this. As a Christian, I've seen the cutest little six-inch Christians. Because they don't take what God has given them and invest it in what grows their character so that God can use them. And that is a great analogy. So I want you to take what God has given you, your talents, your skills, your abilities, your intellect, grow in all those areas. Push yourself. Push yourself. Grow your character to be like Christ. And, and the Bible talks about this over and over, about us doing this. Look at this. Proverbs 23, 23 says this. Invest in truth and wisdom, discipline, good sense, and don't part with them. I love how the message translation puts it. It says this, buy truth. Don't sell it for love or money. Buy wisdom, buy education, buy insight. Look at Proverbs 16, 16. It is much better, much better to have wisdom and knowledge than gold or silver. So if you will take some of the money that you have and invest it in growing your character, you're storing up treasures in heaven. Now, there's all kinds of junk food out there. You know that. But do you know there are spiritual hunk food? There is. Look at this, Isaiah 55, 2. Why spend your money on food that doesn't give you strength? Listen, and I'll tell you where to get food that fattens up the soil. The soil. And what is soul food? It's truth. It's biblical truth. So I got a question to ask you. Are you building your life on junk food? Or are you feeding yourself soul food? Money and all those other things God has given you, your talents, your skills, your ability, your intellect, all those things, your possessions, are tools. And they're meant to be used, yes, by you for your good pleasure. Remember the verse we saw that. But also to be used to grow your character so that you can invest in eternity. Um, it's not to be used to stockpile. I gave you this quote in sermon number two. This quote by Francis Bacon, who died in 1626, he said this, Money is like manure. It's only good if you spread it all around. But if you pile it up, it just starts stinking. So when you take your money and you spread it around, it's like fertilizer. It grows. It matures you. God says money is a test. That's all it is. And I want you, God says, I want you to take some of your money and invest it in this growth fund. Use it for things to help grow your character. Invest in money. Invest your money in making your life better, smarter, wiser. 
more skilled, more like Christ. That's a good use of your money. Now, here's the second fund you can invest your money in. So if you want to store up your treasure in heaven, store up this. I call this God's mutual fund. This fund is about encouraging others through fellowship. So when I use my money to draw us closer together, to build Christian relationships, Christian friendships with other believers, then I'm storing up treasures in heaven. That's God's mutual fund. Look at this. Paul says this in Romans 12, 10. Love one another with mutual affection. Paul writes in Romans 12, 13. Share what you have with God's people who are in need. Show hospitality. Do you know that when you take some of your money and you use it to be hospitable with someone, that's storing up treasure in heaven, God says? You're not wasting that money. You're investing that money. Hebrews 10, 24 puts it this way. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. God says, get creative. Be innovative. Put on your thinking cap how you can motivate each other to acts of love and good works. So I got a question for you. When was the last time you got creative? You got innovative. You put on some intentional thought into getting the people who sit all around you in these pews to work together to show love by doing something good for someone else. That's what God says. Get creative with this. Put on your thinking cap. Find ways to take the people who sit around you right here. How can we work together to show love and do good deeds to other people for the sake of Christ? And, and in God's mutual fund, anytime you do that, you're investing your treasure in heaven. And guess what? It not only draws you closer to God, it draws us closer to each other. Meaning, if you buy a gift for a Christian, you're investing in God's kingdom. If you provide a meal to someone, when they're sick, you're investing, you're storing up your treasures in heaven. When you pay for a babysitter, so a young couple in our church can just go out and have one meal together, you pay for their babysitter, you're, in, you're storing up treasure in heaven. Anytime you open up your home for a small group, you're investing your treasure in heaven. Because there are expenses when you open up your home. You're investing some of that treasure in heaven. When you take a Christian friend out to lunch and you pay for the meal, you are investing, you're storing up your treasure in heaven. That's called God's mutual fund. You'll notice on your outline, I put this, using my money to show love to other believers does three things. First, it proves that I'm in God's family. That's the first thing it does. When you take your money and you use it to help another believer, it proves that you are in God's family. Look at this. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 9, this service of giving, so giving is a service, it's, it's ministry. He says, not only helps the needs of God's people, it also brings many more thanks to God, and it is proof, notice, it is proof of your faith. Many people will praise God because you obey the good news of Christ, the gospel you say you believe, and because you freely share with him. So this verse, if you look at it, tells us there are three great benefits that come from doing this. One, it helps us meet the needs of other people, okay? It brings thanksgiving to God, and it gives us an opportunity to store up our treasure in heaven. If you're not taking some of your money to help another believer, what God would say is this, you need to reevaluate your life because it may indicate you are not a genuine believer. Christians, genuine Christians, will take some of their money and use it to encourage other Christians. And if you're not doing that, it may indicate you're not his. Notice again, it is a proof of your faith. And if you're not doing it, it may indicate you're not his. Here's the second thing it does. It creates unity. It brings unity in the body of Christ. It draws us close together, helping each other with responsibilities, with food, when someone is sick. When we do things like that, it creates unity in the church. Look at Psalm 133.1. It says, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. So it creates unity in the church. Here's the third thing it does. It is a witness to unbelievers. 
when we help each other out, it's a witness to unbelievers. It shows that we love each other, that we care for each other. We're not just about words. We also follow through on our words. John writes this in uh, 3 John 1, 5. He says, when you extend hospitality to Christian brothers and sisters, even when they are strangers, like you invite someone into your home for the first time for a small group you don't know, you make the faith visible. You make the invisible faith become very visible. Okay? Here's a third fund you can invest in. Take your treasure and invest in it. I call it God's service fund. Now, this fund is about helping others through ministry. God wants, to take some, God wants you to take some of your money and use it to help other people in need. And I bet every week in announcements, I give you several ways to do this. And one of the ways I talk about is our crew ministry. First way is through our benevolence ministry to help us help people who have financial trouble. That's one way you can take some of your money. Third is by crew, and that's why I have Keith raise his arm every time. You can go out on some of these local mission trips here. They're all right here locally, and work along with Keith and his crew to help people who need it. Because when we meet their financial or emotional or physical needs, we are doing ministry. We're providing service to someone. In Ecclesiastes 11, 1 through 2, it says this. Be generous. Invest in acts of charity. Charity yields high returns. Don't hoard your goods. Spread them around. Be a blessing to others. This could be your last night. I like he adds that. This could be your last night. In the words of the late Christian financial guru, Larry Burkett, he writes this, do your giving while you're living, then you're knowing where it's going. I like that. Do your living, do your giving while you're living, then you're knowing where it's going. There was a medical study that was conducted to see what were the positive benefits of people helping people who were very sick, had uh, great needs or disabilities. And they, this was a long-term study to see how did those folks who were sick and disabled or whatever their physical or medical needs were, how did they improve? And at the end of this study, they had a dramatic discovery. The discovery was this. The people who improved the most were the people giving the help. They fared better than those who were receiving the help. This is why the Bible said it is better to what? Give than what? Receive. Because the giver gets the bigger blessing than the one receiving. So I want you to learn to live on less so that you will be blessed. There are opportunities all around you to help people both lost and saved. Look at Psalm 72. It says this, people who are in need will cry out and he will save them. He will save those who are hurting. They don't have anyone else who can help them. He will take pity on those who are weak and in need. Their lives are very special to him. Do you see what it says there? Did you hear that? Every person's life, whether they are a Christian or an atheist, their lives are special to God. I have uh, experiences in our, we, well, let me phrase it. We have experiences in our household we call God moments. And that's when God intersects our paths with somebody else's path that we didn't know we were going to intersect with. Okay. And Audrey, Emmy, and I, while on the Daniel Fast, we found this new little restaurant to go to. And uh, we went to it, and we liked it so much, we started going back. We've been back several other times. And uh, over that, those two or three times we've been there, three or four times, I guess, we've tended to get the same server, and we've come to learn her name and where she's from and what she's wanting to do and, and et cetera, and et cetera. And we, we saw this as an opportunity to pour Christ into this lady. We've learned about her past. Uh, we've learned everything. In fact, last week, um, we told Emmy to bring her laptop with her while we went to lunch. Now, we have a rule in our family. Sunday is a Sabbath. Audrey and Emmy cannot do any schoolwork on Sunday. It's a Sabbath. We're commanded to take a day of rest. Sunday's not my Sabbath because I'm working, so I take Monday as my Sabbath. So when we go out, we have another rule. 
when we sit down at the table. No digital devices at the table except my cell phone so that Emmy can read our devotion at the table. So that's one of our rules. So knowing that, when the server walked up and saw Audrey, I mean, saw Emmy on her little laptop, Audrey immediately says, I want to apologize because I know this is not normal. We usually don't do this, but Audrey has been stressing to Emmy she wants, when she works in doing literature, read, writing papers, to use her senses more than just metaphors. And so for her English class, Emmy has been asked, he asked all of the students to write a personal narrative that, on something that's very important to them. So Emmy has chosen to write about her adoption, how she came to be adopted by us, and, and how God had such a major role in bringing her to us. Okay. So we began to tell the server that, and uh, the server was deeply impressed, was deeply touched that Emmy was willing to do that. Um, we wanted Emmy to brainstorm. How could she share with this professor how she came to be adopted, but more specifically, God's role in bringing her to us, okay? And so when we told the server this, she was shocked. She goes, I had no idea you were from Bulgaria. You don't even have an accent. You even know how to say y'all. I, I would have never known. You know? So she was surprised because you really can't tell from Emmy's accent because she really doesn't have one. And so she left and came back a few minutes later and she said this. She said, I collect and use stones. I just remember this one in my pocket. It's called my worry stone. She said, I've been using it and it is from your former country, Bulgaria. So I want you to have it. Now, knowing how so many people today rely upon these stones uh, for positive, they say positive energy and peace and protection. Now, we could have said to her, that's the most stupidest thing we've ever heard of in our life. Keep the stone. We don't want it. And I have been around Christians who have said such things, and immediately they have closed the door to sharing Christ. Emmy accepted the stone because we want the door to remain open. Okay, And so as we continue to talk about this, uh, the girl came back and she said, now when you get that paper done, I want to read it. You see, she gave Emmy this stone from Bulgaria, this rock from Bulgaria that she thinks will, is helping her. You see, our goal is for her to encounter the real rock, the rock of ages, Jesus Christ. And we can Accept a little rock for right now, because one day, this server is going to come to know Jesus Christ as her Lord and Savior. Most Sunday mornings, I get up very, very early. Um, I go down to Katie's to have breakfast and to work on, just rehearse my sermon over and over. They don't open to 8, but they let me come in at 7. And uh, I've known the cook there for years, and so he knows what I want to eat. He, already ha he has it made by the time I get in there. And then he'll come over and he'll say, uh, well, Pastor Kelly, what you preaching on today? When he brings me my breakfast and he'll sit down at the table and I talk to him about what I'm preaching on. He goes, that's an interesting subject. So we talked about today's sermon. He said, do you already have next Sunday's done? I said, yeah. He said, what's that? I said, we're beginning a new series called Spiritual Boot Camp. And next Sunday's sermon is entitled, what do you do when you're ready to throw in the towel? He goes, boy, I'll need that one. Life's horrible. Life's tough. And so I got, when I got ready to leave to go pay, about 8.05, they already have customers in there. And they always ask me, well, Pastor Kelly, and they said out loud because they're all older and they can't hardly hear. Pastor Kelly, what you preaching on today? And I told them. And I told them about next Sunday's sermon. And one of the guys, he said, you know what? I haven't been in church in a long time. I'm going to shock you. What time is your service? I said, 10.15. He says, one Sunday morning. You're going to drop dead because I'm going to walk in. You see, I don't go to Katie's for the food. I go to Katie's to build a relationship to bring people to Christ. That's why I go. That's why I go out to eat. That's why I go to McAllister's. It's not about the food. It's about building these long-term relationships to share Christ with people. Because these college kids that work in most of these restaurants, they're, they're not with mom and dad. They're away from home. 
They've got issues, they've got concerns, they've got problems, and they just want someone to listen to them. So God is setting up what I call God moments around you wherever you go. All you got to do is open your eyes and see them. Open up your ears to hear them. There are people hurting all around you. And when you're generous with your time, you're generous with your money, you're generous with your love of Christ, it will impact those people. Look what Jesus said in Matthew 9. He says this, when he saw the crowds, he felt what? Sorry. When he saw the crowds, he felt sorry for them because they were hurting and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I love how the message translation puts it. It says this, when he looked out over the crowds, his heart what? Oh. Thank you. I'm ahead of myself. When was the last time you looked around in a restaurant, in a grocery store, around a gas pump, around your classroom, around the gym, around a store, around a doctor's or veterinarian's room, and your heart broke? See, when I go in even any place, doctor's office, I don't sit there and get on my phone. I look around who's in here. And I just start praying for the people in the waiting room. God, I don't know what's going on in their life. And when I go back, they take me back, I, I always... Get God worked into the conversation. Whoever's in going to take care of me, the nurse, technician, the doctor, the PA, whoever they are, because it's a God moment. It's not about just getting a physical. It's not just about getting blood drawn. It's about looking around and realizing that God has engineered this for you to make a difference in people's lives. It says that when he looked out over the crowds, his heart broke. Does your heart break for the people God brings into your life, in the grocery store, in the doctor's office, in your classroom. When you look at the neighbors who live around you, this is an important part about in investing your treasure in heaven. Look at Proverbs eleven twenty four: The world of the generous gets larger and larger, but the world of the stingy gets what? Smaller and smaller. You need to memorize that verse. You want God to expand your world, expand your influence, be generous. If you want to hoard it and hold it, he'll just shrink it down. He'll make you one miserable person. The more you help others, the more God blesses you. Why? Because God is a giver. And the more you are generous, the more you're like God, and that God will bless you for being it. This is why God has commissioned his church to take care of the poor. Look at Proverbs 28, 27. Give to the poor, and you'll never be in need. But if you close your eyes to the poor, many curses will come upon you. You see, God has commanded the church to take care of the poor, not any government, not social services. It's our responsibility to care for the poor. Look at Proverbs 19.70. When you give to the poor, it's like lending to the Lord, and he will pay you back. That's an amazing promise. When you take care, you help somebody who's poor, it's like loaning money to God, but he's going to pay you back more than you could ever imagine. Here's another great. Look at Proverbs 21, 13. If you refuse to respond to the cries of the poor, then God will not respond to you when you cry out to him for help. And this is why every week, in addition to our tithe we give to this church, we have $25 that come out of our checking account that goes to the International Mission Board's World Hunger Fund. Every penny of that goes to provide food and medicine to children and people around the world who are starving and who are sick. In addition to that, we have another check for $35 that comes out that goes to Stephen Curtis Chapman's foundation called Show Hope. This provides free medical care to orphans around the world who have disfigurement, who have birth defects. They would never be able to get the surgeries or the corrections they need without the donations of Christians. We do this above and beyond our tithe because why? God wants us caring for the poor. Now, here's your fourth fund you can put your money in. I call this God's global fund. This is about reaching others through missions and evangelism. So in, every time I take some of my money and I use it, put it in God's global fund to reach people for Christ, then I'm, I'm, I'm storing up treasure in heaven. So that when you go out and you provide funds for Bibles to be bought and distributed, when you uh, give some of your money to, to pay for a Christian seminar or for someone else, when you take your money and you use it to help 
go on a mission trip or send someone else on a mission trip, then you are investing in God's global fund. God says, you're storing up your treasure in heaven. God wants you to use some of your money to do good around the rest of this world. Look at Luke 16, 9. Jesus says this. Use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you'll be welcomed in eternal dwellings. I mean, that's the strangest verse. Look at that. A lot of people have no idea what it means when they read that. Use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when you're gone, you'll be welcomed into eternal dwellings. What is Jesus saying? He's saying invest, invest your money in getting people into heaven. That's what he's saying. So that when you get to heaven, they will welcome you there. Think about that. You take some of your money and you invest it in the missions by going on mission trips, helping others go on mission trips, whatever it is, spreading the gospel around the world, providing Bibles and et cetera. You die. All of a sudden, you're in heaven. Somebody walks up to you and goes, you know, you, you didn't know me. But I lived in the country of Iran, and because of your generosity, a, a, a Bible was given to me, and I came to know Jesus Christ. I'm here because of you. Now, isn't that worth it? Isn't it worth it to know that you can make a difference in helping people you may never know here, but they walk up to you? And people say, I'm here because of you. 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 See, the greatest investment of your life is you investing in getting people into heaven. There is no higher use of your money. None. Jesus said, I came to seek and to save the lost. He didn't say, I came to seek those in the church who need more material possessions. The greatest gift you can do, the greatest investment you can have is help people come to know Jesus Christ, to spread the gospel. I mean, I make no apology about this. The most important thing you'll do with your money, the most important thing is to invest it in different funds, particularly this global fund, to help people come to know Jesus Christ. Look at 3 John 1.8. It says this, we must support believers who go on trips like this so that we can work together with them in spreading the truth. He's talking about mission trips in his day. Some of you, I know you can't go on a mission trip. Maybe you've got young children at home and you, you can't leave them. Or, excuse me, or you've got physical aging issues you can't go. But you can certainly pay to help somebody else go on a mission trip. So why don't you do that? You could be part of our crew ministry. Help Keith and his team around here. Just make a difference in some people's lives, especially lost people's lives, to come know Jesus Christ. Look at 2 Corinthians 9, 13. You will honor God through this genuine act of service because of your commitment to spread the good news of Christ and because of your generosity in sharing with them and everyone else. How do you honor God? By providing funds so that people come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Spreading the good news of Jesus Christ is the greatest thing you can do. I don't know if you heard this. This year was the highest offering ever for the Lottie Moon Christian offering. Our denomination received over $3 billion for Lottie Moon. Just this week, they sent out 30 new full-time couples to be foreign missionaries because of your gifts. Now, isn't that worth it? Isn't that worth it? This is why I push the Lottie Moon Christmas offering, because our missionaries don't have to raise their funds. We provide the funds for them to go. We provide their health care. We provide their retirement. We provide their pay. We cover everything for them. We provide for their moving expenses, their language training, everything. We do this all around the world. And so Lottie Moon is for international missions. And in a couple of weeks, I'll start pushing the Annie Armstrong Easter offering, which is pays for all of our full-time missionaries in North America, Canada, the United States, and Mexico. Isn't it worth your investment to help other people come to know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? You know, the other thing our family does, it's actually Audrey's idea. I, I, I didn't come up with this. And uh, she has this little package here she keeps in her pocketbook. Nice little thing. 
Nice little thing. Very colorful. Turquoise. Got little dogs on it. Are you surprised? Her love for animals, all right? And uh, she calls this her a ministry. This here is a ministry for her. I'll show you why. How many of you like chocolate or peanut M&Ms? Ooh, I see the hands going. Reg uh, this is caramel M&Ms. Ooh, these are the mini M&Ms. Ooh, yes. And uh, regular M&Ms. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I'm, I'm making you salivate already, aren't I? See, when we go out to eat, here's the other thing we do. We not only develop this relationship with the server, we tip them exceptionally well, usually around 20%. And then Audrey opens up this bag. She says, you've been a great server, even if they haven't. And I have this and this and this and this. Which one would you like? Now, I'll tell you, stats, these are the number one people ask for. Okay? And then what does she do? She writes a personal note to them about their service, and she always works in Jesus Christ and her faith. There are God opportunities all around you. You just have to take the initiative to say that that lost person's soul is more important to you than your comfort zone. And you can do it in safe ways. And if you want to know where these are, Sam's. They're called their fundraising package. It comes in a nice little M&M yellow box. So I expect some of you this week, you'll go to Sam's and buy it. Good. Imitation is the best form of flattery. Make a difference in people's lives for Jesus Christ. Now, that brings me to the last one. Here's the last fund you can invest in. It's called God's Treasury Fund. This fund is about praising God and worship through tithing. That's what this is about. When you give your money, when you give your tithes, okay, the Bible says that's an act of worship itself. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago. We looked actually at this verse a few weeks ago, Proverbs 3, 9. It says this, honor the Lord by giving him the first part of all your income, and he'll fill your barns and overflow your barrels. I mean, that's a promise. I, I don't you know. Our daughter basically works full time for a bet. She's got four college classes she's taking right now. But from the day she started make, getting her first paycheck, our daughter has tithed to this church at least 10% of her income from every paycheck. Because we want our daughter to know, we want our daughter to believe that all of this belongs to God. And it's better that she invest in his kingdom and his righteousness. And if she will do that, she'll get a lot of blessings from God along the way herself. So when you take some of your money, you take at least 10% of that money, and you invest it in God's kingdom, okay, that's called a tithe. If you give above that 10%, that's called an offering. Look at this in Deuteronomy 14, 23. It says this. The purpose of tithing is to teach you to always put God first in your life. That's called God's treasury fund. Now, I want you to think of it. I want you to go back to your childhood. Some of you are already, some of you are young. You're in your teens or in your college age years. But go back to when you were a little, little kid. Okay? And it was your, one of your parents' birthdays. And you got to come up with a gift to give them. You know, children, they try to get very creative. But children are at the mercy of their parents for either money to do this or creativity to do this, sometimes both. Okay? Do you remember as a child you may have given your parent at Christmas or their birthday some cheesy little thing that was a dinky old thing? Okay? It was your thoughtfulness that counted. It was your sacrifice. And, and if your parents gave you a little money along the way, you know, they gave you a little stipend to help you, a little allowance. You actually took your parents' money that they had given you to go buy your parents a gift, right? But it was the thought that count. Your parents appreciated it. I have in my church office up there little gifts from kids from our church. I leave them on my desk to remind me of the kindness of the children of this church, okay? Some are airplanes. Some are drawings. One of them gave me this big stuffed purple bear. It sits in the corner, okay? So I have these little gifts. I've been in homes of some of our senior adults, and they'll have up on their refrigerator door a handprint of their grandchild, and they are so proud of that. 
I've been in homes with some of our senior adults. They'll have a ceramic plate of their children that is 50 or 60 years old still up on the wall. Yeah, it's not a Rembrandt, but it's more than a Rembrandt. It was given and made in love. And when you give your tithe to the church, you give your tithe to the Lord, okay, you're putting God first in your life. Look at this. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 21, wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. That's why God wants us to give our tithes and offerings. Because where our money goes is where our heart goes. I mean, if you were to buy stock in Microsoft or Apple or Amazon, I know what you'd do. You'd monitor that stock. You'd see how it's doing. You'd want to know, is it going up? Is it going down? Do I need to move it? Do I need to sell it? You'd monitor it because you care about it. You've invested in it. You would take good, you'd pay great attention to it. So wherever I put my money, that's where my heart goes as well. So i got a question for you. Where is your heart today? Where is your heart today? Where are your values? What are your priorities? Regardless of what you say is important, there are two things that show what is important to you. One is where your money goes, and second is where your time goes. Those two things show what's very important to you, where your money goes and where your time goes. It'll come up in a minute, okay? Because the way you spend your time and the way you spend your money determines what's important to you, what's of value to you. It shows what you worship. It shows what's important to you. It shows what is of value to you. Those two things, your money and your time, show all of that. Jesus says, wherever your treasure is, your heart will also be. So if you want your heart to be with God, then one of the things you do, you invest your tithes and offerings into the work of God. And if you ever, ever, ever feel distant from God, there are two things you can do to fix that. One is share your faith with someone, and second, give an offering. Sharing your faith and giving an offering or giving your tithe will draw you closer to God because it's going to make you more like God because God is a giver. He loves to give. It also helps break the grip of materialism on your life. Every time you give your tithes and your offerings, remember what I said a couple of weeks ago? It's an act of worship. Look at Job 22. It says this. Give up your lust for money, and the Almighty himself will be your treasure. I want to close with this kind of analogy. Imagine that you, we just learned that on, Dece, on December 31st, 2001, the United States government will end the current currency we have. And on January 1, 2022, we will start using euros. That will become the currency of America. Now just imagine that for a moment. So what does that mean if you know now that your dollars are going to be worthless January 1, 2022, what are you going to do? You're going to start immediately converting your assets over into euros, right? And then you'll keep enough of the American dollars left to kind of get you through to the end of the year. If you don't do that, come January 1, 2022, everything you have is worthless. One day you're going to have this great conversion. It's called death. You're going to stand before God. And you're going to be evaluated on... Where did you store up your treasure on this life? Did you, did you send it ahead or did you keep it for yourself? God tells us that you can store up treasure for yourselves in heaven. Uh, I heard about this wealthy man who, uh, who had died and went to heaven. He was met at the pearly gates by St. Peter. And St. Peter began to walk him down the streets of gold and showing him all these wonderful mansions. He said, such and such lives here and such and such lives there. Such and such is there. And he just kept going and going and going. And, and the street was long and they kept pointing out. It really didn't matter because they lived for eternity. And then he finally got to the end of the street and there was this old, broken down, dingy shack. And he looked at the rich guy and he says, that's yours. That's where you're going to be for eternity. And the guy says, why do I get this ugly, dingy, broken down shack and everybody else gets a mansion. Peter said, well, we did the best we could with the little treasure you stored up. You, you can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead of you. Jesus said, store up your treasures in heaven. By storing them up in God's 
growth fund, his mutual fund, God's global fund, God's treasury fund, God's service fund. And when you do that, you're storing up treasures. You're sending it ahead of you. I don't know if you know who Jim Elliott is. Jimmy Elliott was part of five missionaries back in the 60s. They went down to Ecuador to reach an indigenous people called the Alka Indians. And in the process, they were speared to death, all five men. They were killed for their faith. And though they had guns and could have protected themselves, when one of their children asked them, if they come after you, Dad, will you kill them? He said, no. If I kill them, they go to hell. And I can't live with myself with that. But they kill me, I go to heaven. Jim Elliott had this wonderful quote. I want to share it with you. He said this, He is no fool who gives up what he cannot keep for that which he cannot lose. Are you sending it ahead? Are you investing? Are you storing up your treasures in heaven? You know, when Moses' was Moses' time came to die, Moses gives his speech to the people. Joshua will take the people, and he'll eventually lead them into the promised land and conquer it. But Moses, is, some of his final words are found in the book of Deuteronomy. And he says this, beginning in Deuteronomy 8. Make sure you don't forget God, your God, by not keeping his commandments, his rules and regulations that I command you today. Make sure that when you eat and are satisfied, you build pleasant houses and settle in, see more and more money come in, Watch your standard of living going up and up. Make sure you don't become so full of yourself and your things that you forget God. Your God, the God who delivered you from all kinds of slavery, who led you through huge and fearsome troubling times, who helped you get through the desert periods of your life. And when life tried to strike you like poisonous vipers and scorpions, it was God who protected you. Do not forget to remind yourself that everything good in your life, everything you have is a gift from God. All of this has been a test from God for you to see if you will invest in God's purpose as he invests in you. Don't waste God's investment in you because if you do, others will suffer and pay for it with their very lives. You got a chance to store up treasure in heaven. The question is, will you do it? Southside, that's how... God takes your faith and your finances and helps you have a fresh start. Let's pray.